is a held icon. Land can stay there so long as they are Christians. So that's the short story of Makotopo. So if you're not a Christian, you are not a... I think so much Christians guide their children to become Christians. Yes. It was guidance, I think. Okay. So, uh, any highlights then, you know, um, in that? Uh... The boy must go on to, to high school. No farming. For no farming. And in fact, I was lucky because Uncle Paul, the one who was a Teflo. Yes. And uh, in fact, you know, now this is the time where you are getting to be a young man. You're starting to... Uh, sometimes you would come quite late. You make sure you know when the last bus goes. And many times we would use Saturdays. Oh, second year anatomy. Yes. Saturday would be full of students because now you are catching up with that pace that uh, you are uh, lagging behind with. Mm. So yes, they took the the one other adjustment that had to occur, as you were talking about adjustments in the area, were subject matter adjustments. Yeah. Because here's somebody with maths physics now coming into an area of content subject. Mm. So I must say, I mean, uh, that's where, you know, there was a big adjustment. I had to start getting used to to fighting for middle and lower positions. <laughs> <laughs> so your anatomy and physiology, uh, but you still, you did not repeat second year? No, 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 I did not, uh, I did not. No, I mean, you had to apply yourself. It's just that you had to apply yourself more mm. than when we were doing maths and physics, mm. because when you had the concept, there wasn't much more application. But here, if you don't know that uh, a vein goes this way, you can't work it out. You go to see it, you go to read it, and yeah. you can't work it out. So you went into third year, fourth year, fifth year, and was it 1975 when you then got your MPCHP? 1979. Oh, 1979. 1979. My father was, a, was a, in a senior lecturer in obstetrics and, gyneco and gynecology. By that time? At that time, if. Prof. Yves Mokoko. Yes. Uh, I say so because, in fact, uh, I don't know whether it is because of that, but my best pass was in ONG. Well, not, not that he showed me the paper. In fact, I was in other people's groups rather than his. Yeah. I don't know whether it was the blood of him, but that was my best. My best performance was obstetrics and gynecology. The funny thing is that, you know, when I interviewed him a few weeks ago, he actually said that was his best subject as well. That's why he actually pursued ONG uh, as a registrar and then obviously as a, as a, as a specialist. So, but during that time, uh, as an undergraduate medical student, any highlights there worth talking about? No, I don't want to tell lies. I struggled like other students and... Uh, so from being a first-class kind of guy yeah. to being my daughter's, my daughter's school, school. My daughter's you know, school. your 50 And I was happy with that. Uh, as long as you, got, you did not repeat a class. As long as you did not repeat a class. But as you go towards the end, then the oomph starts coming up. And I think that's why I almost get a, got a distinction in ONG, but I didn't get it. But I missed it uh, by uh, a whisper. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as you were finishing your undergraduate medical degree, you've now been exposed to most of the disciplines of medicine. Yeah. You know, did you already then have an idea that I will pursue surgical, you know, type of postgraduate training or, or you didn't have an idea by the time you, you got your undergraduate degree? You're asking a good question. Naturally, because my best Max Wayne, obstetrics and gynecology. Yeah. I actually wanted to be, to specialize in ONG. But wouldn't that have been a problem for you? Because then you would always be under the shadow of your dad. You know, I mean, you would be compared with him. It's uh, like, it's like you are him because that's exactly what he told me. When, when I was, when I was a, a house, I was lucky that when he came to Harangua Hospital as a head of ONG, I also finished and came to Harangua Hospital as a houseman. And so as I was finishing houseman, he started asking me, 
by the way, your grandfather wouldn't like you to go in, wouldn't have liked you to go in into private practice. You must think of specializing. He himself was stopped from going into private practice. Mm. And he had to So specialize. now he was telling you so he was telling that me you also are not going to go to private practice. That the grandfather you respect so much would not like you to go to private practice. You must think of specializing. I said, yes, I've, I've thought of it. And he said, what do you want to specialize in? I said, ONG, of course. It was my best subject. And he says to me, so long as you will, you will stay with peace for being second fiddle, there's a bull already in the crawl. <laughs> so long as you know there's a bull in the crawl. The boss. Be, Aha. Now that made me think hard. Because I realized, hell, he, this is true. There's no way I can match this. Uh, but the idea was to be an ONG specialist. I then met a professor of neurosurgery who taught us at the uh, University of uh, Natal. And he was also at Medunsa at that time. I met him on the corridor. Mm. And I greeted him. And I suddenly said, Professor, can I do neurosurgery? He said, come tomorrow, you will start tomorrow. Just like that? Just like that. That's how I went to, to neurosurgery. Professor Jube, may his, rose, may, may, may his soul rest in peace. So Prof. Jube opened yeah. up the opportunity for you. Yeah, yes. Without having to motivate much, you know, for you or compete with others for that position. You must know that in the past, the heads of departments had immense powers. They trained who they wanted to train. And that's true. Things have changed now. It's one of the good things you can say about the new system. You don't leave it to one man to decide. You have to have a committee and so on. Uh, even, uh, you know, employment equities and things like yeah. that. But then, Ed will decide who he trains. So, you know, Professor Joubert looked at me and was impressed with the fact that I excitedly greeted him because I respected what he used to do to us. But then neurosurgery in undergraduate training used to be, you know, maybe that one lecture. Oh, yes. You know, you right. didn't really get the total picture. You're quite there right. would be so much of general surgery and other forms of surgery. Neurosurgery, guys from Wentworth uh, Hospital uh, who were doing, uh, I think, uh, neurosurgery there. But we didn't really know much. One lecture, and if you miss it, you had bunked that lecture. That's it. Well, things were bad during our time. During our time, they were not much better, but there were only five lectures for us. But you know, Professor Jube impressed us so much in the way he gave those lectures and that we understood his language. And, and so when, he said, when I looked at him, I said, I want to do neurosurgery. Mm. And when he said, come tomorrow, and when I went to the old man, to say, oh, I'm not doing ONG anymore. I'm now doing neurosurgery. He says, that's better because there are no black neurosurgeons. Mm. That's what he told me. Mm. So that's how you then got, that's to how be I got under the wings of Professor Jube. Jube, yes. And how long did that uh, training take you? Between uh, 1982 to 84, was medical officer from their registrar post until I, I finished in 1987. It's a total of five years, but if you do medical officer, it's extra yeah. before you get a registrar post. Mm. Because registrar post, you had to wait for them. It's whoever was, is in there should Must finish pass first. before you go in. Uh, during that time, he had few. You know, Medunsa was just starting. I think Professor Jube had two or three posts. Yes. So um, you eventually went in, you underwent the training. There's the first part and the second part, those exams that you write. Did you fail any of them or you just passed all of them on your way towards being a qualified uh, neurosurgeon? I'm not going to tell you lies. The first part, I failed twice. That the, was bad, you know. The great uh, Professor Samuel Lichetta Mubopo. Absolutely, absolutely. Failing uh, an exam. The fellow, you know, there, are two, there were two streams of qualifications yeah. for us. It was the fellow of the College of Surgeons 
from the college yes of med the you know the college colleges of, of medicine yes and then there was the the MNET. MNET. but the one that had the prestige the prestige was this one and i wasn't going to bypass it so i used to write and they were separate during that time yeah there's the first part second part third part i used to take each one of them first parts together mm. i passed that side i failed here mm. And I can't go to second part before I repeat and pass this side. So I had to do it three times. That was tough during that time. Mm. And in fact, they, they no more have exams made deliberately tough as they did during that time. And of course, the consultants used to tell us, you know, jokingly, that, you know, we make you a, a doctor. Instead of going to make money, you come and want to compete with us. So this one is tougher. It was tough. It was a joke, but they made things tough. But it was third time lucky for you. No, no, I was I was going to prepare. I was prepared to go four, five. There yeah. was no limit. Yeah. But I can tell you, when I went for the third time, my my brain was ringing. And and just to show you how much one knew about anatomy. Yeah. The question I I got, our group got, and and I was going to be a neurosurgeon was a 25 marks question on the big toe. As a neurosurgeon? The, no, look, all of us had to write the same. Yes. I'm just saying now that I was going to do neurosurgery, you would think I would not concentrate on those things. Yeah. I had to concentrate even on, on the penis, I yeah. tell you, because I was going to fail if I didn't do that. <laughs> 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 all right, so you got your first part. Um, and um, then there's the second part, uh, and then the third part until you qualify. Uh, yeah. No, fortunately, when it came to the second part, and I did both, those are more practical. Most those are clinical. Well, there I I, I sailed through. Me. Yeah. And third and third part again. Third part, I I I dropped the one side. The, that is the college side. The college side. It's always the college side. Yeah. You know, funny enough, it's the same examiners. Mm. College came first. They came to, med, to, 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 to the college. I failed. When it went to the MMET and they came and examined, I passed. But then wasn't there this issue those days around the college and the and the MMAT side, the master's side, um, where the college was largely uh, English influenced and uh, the, the, the Africans universities like Pretoria um, and, and Free State were more for the MMAT. It's the direction. other way around. Oh. It's the other way around. There were no MMATs, there was just college before to qualify everybody. Yeah. And so college had very much a Jewish and English influence. Yes. And so this thing of people failing and failing annoyed the rulers who were the Africaners. They said, we must get an alternative way of producing specialists. We won't go anywhere. So the MMEDs were started by African speaking universities. Yes. And then they decided you then know. you can become a specialist oh, yes, without having to absolutely. write the Absolutely, and so exams. Medunsa, because it was run by Af the African-speaking professors, yes. naturally Emmet came in with Medunsa yes. from the onset. But in the end, it's the same content, same examiners. It was politics on the one side. Yeah, you see. To control how, to how control, many yes. you know, people you were see. non- English or non-Jew right. could actually... That was the notion then. Yeah. And in fact, it was more than a notion because they acted on it. It was promulgated in government that MMAT will qualify you as a specialist. A specialist. Yeah. Okay. So you eventually got to be a neurosurgeon. What year was this? 1987. I registered 1987. Yes. And how did you feel? Eventually, your dream, you know, from that chance encounter with Prof. Jube in the passage to now being a qualified neurosurgeon? 
I felt good because neurosurgery is really challenging. The brain being complex and the the type of care you need to, it's it, you know it uh, it was a compromise to do to doing maths and physics. Mm. Yeah, and so it it became an exciting thing, uh, exciting career to me. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Now before you took neurosurgery, you were told that there were no black neurosurgeons. So by the time you qualified, were there any before? No, I was the first black, whether African, Indian, I was the first to, to qualify through the South African qualifications. Maybe some people went outside and qualified, the UK but and in our country I was the first. And, 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 and was there any weight of expectation from that for you? Absolutely, yes, immense, because if you are the first, people expect you to train others. And so private practice was never in my mind. I had to stay in a teaching institution until I retire, and I did that. And I'm glad to say when I retired, I put 20 extra black neurosurgeons in the field. And overall, it was more than 20, but if you want to focus on, on black, yes. But... Um, in one of the articles that uh, were written about you, uh, you know, from uh, I think Pretoria News uh, in 2018, you lament <laughs> the fact that uh, you stayed poor because you were within a public service and some of the guys you produced as neurosurgeons, they went and became multimillionaires and uh, you were... No. Just the same Mukhogong who no, was no. just doing okay, uh, not uh, making as much money uh, no. because of the, uh, also about the, the fact that your, your, your dad had instilled in you the fact that you can't be chasing money. Look, okay, yes and no, yes and no. The lament of, of, of the money side, I chose not to go that way. Yeah. However, it, the lament was in a different line because I was, I was asked about my family. Oh. And I told them that my great-grandfather was a traditional healer and he was a consultant traditional healer. Like I was a consultant neurosurgeon. I'm a consultant neurosurgeon. And I told them a consultant, tra consultant traditional healer goes from village to village. When they can't solve a problem in a certain village, they say, call so-and-so. When he goes there, they thank him with either cattle or a wife. So my great-grandfather had lots of cattle and about 10 wives. So I say, you know, I, that's what I lament. I work so hard, here I, uh, I stay with nothing. Uh, but of course, I have there's one only wife. one wife as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was the only lament I had. Okay, but in humor. Yes. yes. Okay. So uh, you became a neurosurgeon. Was there any special interest within the field of neurosurgery? Um, you know, as you started your career in that space, we will get to the conjoint twins yeah, yeah. because most of us uh, at the time we got to know about your involvement in the separation of Siamese twins at Barra, and then also when you went to Medunsa, uh, you know, I think there's a couple of high profile Siamese twins that uh, you were part of separating, you know, the Mpon Mponyana, the Makweba twins, uh, the ones from Zambia, uh, and many others. But besides the, you know, the, 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 the conjoined twins or Siamese twins, in the area of field of neurosurgery, was there an area that you felt I'm very passionate about? This is an area I want to uh, create, you know, new knowledge and new experiences there. You're asking a good question. And the answer is, I'm a general neurosurgeon. Simply because when we have few teachers to teach everything, it's better that they know everything. Mm. Uh, well, a bit of everything, if you want to say. You can know a lot of everything. Yes. But also the type of practice that we have, that many patients we have, the hospitals that we have, you would not subdivide neurosurgery 
uh, into this, this, this public hospital. In other words, you had to look after everybody mm. who comes with a neurosurgical condition. You could not afford. There are a few uh, places that are uh, super specializing now. Mm. Uh, obviously, University of Cape Town always had pediatric neurosurgery. Yes. And, and I think they are the only teaching neurosurgical center that has a separate pediatric neurosurgery. All of us had to do deal General. with kids and everybody's spines and brains. Yeah. Yes. Looking within that field of neurosurgery, uh, the fact that you've produced more to date, I mean, there's many other people who've also produced more. Yeah, um, and, and they Do you get a that. sense of pride in the fact that you have contributed in such a highly specialized field of medicine. You know, so many, uh, I mean, more than 20 people that you've produced. Uh, I do have a, a great sense of pride, yes, that uh, indeed I've achieved the aim. The aim of staying was not just to say, but it was to stay and train. Multiply yourself. Yeah, to stay and train. And now, now neurosurgery, is no more unreachable. There are lots of neurosurgeons, thanks to me. And of course, no doubt other people did that as well. Mm. Because once you do that, everybody will also want to be seen to be doing that. Yeah. So I'm not saying I'm the only one, yeah. but certainly my influence influenced a lot of places to do that. But in the earlier days, it was very much a male-dominated Speciality. Uh -huh. But nowadays I'm seeing younger, you know, women, black women who are actually neurosurgeons. I think there's about five or six already who are under the age of 35 who are neurosurgeons. You women. Women. And most of them were trained by me. The first one, I think the third and the fourth. Mm. Yes. So I'm proud that I could do that as well. Okay, so you've made the field accessible. Accessible completely. So, Prof, um, most people know you as that neurosurgeon who has been involved in a number of operations to separate Siamese twins, or what we call conjoined twins. Yeah. Uh, some of us got to know about you uh, in 1987. Yeah. where you were a junior consultant in neurosurgery uh, at Chris, well, it was Baragwanath Hospital those days. It was not Chris, honey, Baragwanath. It was yeah. just Baragwanath yeah. Hospital. Yeah. Now, you were part of the team of neurosurgeons yeah. that separated Mpo and Mponyana. Yeah. How did you get to be in that team? I would expect that, uh, you know, it was the top dogs and you were a junior consultant. Yes, no. In fact, the question is, how did I get to work at Baragwanath Hospital? Maybe let's start there. Yes, I, was, I trained at uh, Medunsa. Medunsa. You did talk about the fact that, uh, you know, certain universities are, are looked down upon. Yeah. And it was, my, it was my desire to try and uh, illustrate that uh, you can get as good at Medunsa as we get elsewhere. That's so, so I trained at Medunsa when I completed. I wanted to come to work at the uh, University of Pretoria. Truly speaking, we considered the then head of neurosurgery at the University of Pretoria, the best neurosurgeon in the country, the late uh, Professor Van Rensberg. May his soul rest in peace. He, he really wanted me to work with him. And uh, uh, he was pleased that I chose to work with him. But of course, when it was during the time of apartheid, and so he had forgotten that, he almost forgot that we're in apartheid. Mm. So as he went to the superintendent's side, uh, that he's trying- That was HF Fervood. HF Fervood Hospital. As he went to the superintendent's side, he obviously was blocked because it means you'd be operating blacks and whites there. When he came to me, one thing he didn't tell me straight, but I read between the lines. Uh, he says, I wanted to work, you to work here, but you know I had problems with the superintendent, but I, I got a friend at Baragwanath. 
uh, Professor, uh, the head of, of, of neurosurgery at Barawanath. Uh, the name the, slip, uh, It's fine. Lipschitz, That's... Lipschitz. How can I forget Prof Lipschitz? I am getting old. Yeah. Professor Lipschitz. So, uh, so I say to him, uh, is he as good as you? Is 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 Lipschitz. that's as good as Pretoria? You know what his answer was? Any place is better than Medunsa. <laughs> Just what you said. It was spoke. It was people spoke about it. Yeah. Anyway, I then had to go and work at Baragwanath Hospital, staying here. I didn't relocate because the idea was to come and bring Medunsa up. So for two years I worked there. This is when the, the, the story of the Sandwich twins came. Uh, it was in 1988 when it, yeah. I was there in 1987 and 88. They came there, yeah, they were born in 1987. Yes, they were operated, operated in 1988. Yes. Look, there were not many consultants then in neurosurgery. It was Professor Lipschitz uh, and two other prof, uh, uh, consultants, three other consultants. I was the fourth. So, I mean, I was junior to the rest of them. Yes. But the whole team got involved because it wasn't such a big team that you could say, you know, this must be involved, the others mustn't be. Yeah. And it was a, a special thing in the sense that it's a rare thing for conjoined twins to be joined at the head. Uh, literature then said it's one in 2.5 million births. So it's quite rare. And, and the ones that were reported earlier were not successful in the separation. Mm. So we had, we had a, quite a moment to, to deal with. And Prof Lipschitz and then Ben Carson, Ben in, Carson in from America, the US. At the same time, had a set of Siamese twins, the German twins, the Binde twins. They were born in Germany. Mm. But because of the rareness of this operation, the, the, the German neurosurgeons didn't want to touch them. Because, you know, you, you can leave them to grow up. And so they didn't want to touch them until somebody said, take them across to to America, there's a fellow Ed, called Ben Carson, Johns Hopkins Johns Hospital. Hopkins. Yes, that's in Baltimore. Baltimore, yes. Johns Hopkins Hospital. So in fact, those two sets were done. The, we handled them simultaneously. Mm. And in fact, Professor Lipschitz did not tie the fact that he's cross-communicating with his colleague, the other side, Carson. Mm. Little did I know, Carson was, was an African man. So I said, okay, this is another white man they call Carson. Yeah. And as we went towards the exams, Prof Lipschitz said, I'll let Carson go first. Mm. And then we will discuss and then we go. And so this is, this is what happened. Okay. So it was a rare thing. And uh, I, was, I was lucky to be amongst them. Right place at the right time to yes. give you an opportunity on something that was quite rare. And in fact, it was the first step towards the others that way, to come straight to me. Mm. This is the way God works sometimes. Yes. Now, you successfully as a team separated those twins. Yes. They... Um, one of them lived for quite yeah. some time, but the other yeah. one, I think uh, they didn't live for too long. Yeah, no. It happens that as the two brains are joined, yeah. uh, when you separate them, one of them is going to get more affected than the other, depending on the anatomy and the parts that you go through, the vessels that you cut. That you cut. So it's, it's a well-known thing that the one tends to get weaker than the other. In fact, in many cases... On next week's episode on SA Health Icon. The one won't make it, and, and you can work out and talk to the parents to see head of neurosurgery at Medunsa, at Harangua Hospital. Yeah, highlights or you know, pride some of the students that you would say, you know, um, when I meet this. Actually, level the playing fields because obviously. The